really aware uh, of, of beginning to write in, in high school, but I think probably, uh, I think I really got started before that. That is to say, I became aware of poetry and, and saw it as something that maybe I'd like to do. Uh, in seventh grade, we read Homer's Odyssey in translation, and that, was, that book made a big impact on me. Um, <clears throat> so I would say that at that time I was, I, I was probably hooked, although I didn't know it. Um, in high school, I really think that I, I got started uh, writing primarily out of my, uh, the interest that my English teachers took in me, um, Irene Martin and Wanda Cromer at Lincoln High. And um, they encouraged me when uh, I would show them uh, other kinds of writing. I'm not sure that I showed them poetry, but the whole atmosphere that they created was very conducive to uh, the production of literature. I, I do remember I wrote a short story about the uh, Cuban Revolution in 1959. Um, then when I got to the University of Nebraska, I took some things into Carl Shapiro, and um, he was more or less my mentor during the time I was at the university. So I was very lucky to have somebody like that to study with, and I stumbled into his office as a freshman with a stack of things that I thought were poems that high, typed out on pink copy paper from the Lincoln Journal where I was a reporter, and um, he was nice enough to read them and get them back to me in about three or four months and saying, I think these show some promise and you should get into some directed reading courses and so forth. And uh, so he was very generous to me and I've, I've always tried to be generous to younger poets to sort of repay that. Uh, influences are just really too many to name. I, I really think that a writer probably is influenced one way or another by everything that he or she writes or, or reads. Uh, if you if you read something that you think is really bad, you're influenced by that. If you read something that, uh, that you would really like to have done, you're influenced by that. I think part of the trick is, uh, is finding over a period of time as a young writer what is really your subject matter. And um, it, it's usually described as discovering your own voice um, and then realizing that, um, you know, that your voice is not something that is adequate to all subjects and all occasions. You, part of the process of maturing as a writer is discovering what you can't write about. Uh, you, you just, you're, you're not fitted to do it. I, th I think there are, I think that's very true. Uh, most writers might not be comfortable admitting that, but uh, I'm, I'm always looking to extend my range, to extend my boundaries. But um, once you've developed a style, once you are recognizable as writing in a certain manner, uh, you've been typecast, essentially, by readers, and uh, I'm always uncomfortable with that and trying to push the boundary out a little bit. Well, I was driving down in the car tonight, and I was telling uh, <clears throat> my wife that I, I really love poetry readings. Um, they're a wonderful, a wonderful thing for me uh, <clears throat> to get in, in on the celebration of language and to pick up uh, a sense of another poet's work, uh, and obliquely to find out something about my own work. Um, and then I was telling her how much I uh, loved a poetry reading when I was on the other side, and how much I dreaded poetry readings when I was the poet who was reading. Um, <clears throat> because I think primarily, uh, I don't know why, but I get terribly nervous. Tonight I'm not nearly as nervous as I normally am. That may be a bad sign, I'm not sure. Um, but I think the thing about it is that when you are the performing poet, you are very much like a horse with blinkers on. You just are sort of in harness and in the traces, and you just kind of keep going. Uh, and you really don't have a very good sense a lot of times, or at least I don't, of, uh, of the performance. Uh, I'm, I'm too busy <clears throat> trying not to read canceled lines that float up in my manuscripts and so forth. Um, well, anyway, um, <clears throat> I, I, I am in, in harness and in the traces, and I uh, thought that I would try to read uh, tonight some poems taken from different sources. Um, first of all, I would like to read uh, four poems from my book, Pointing Out the Sky, which was published in 1985. 
I think that will balance there. <clears throat> Recreation. This is the morning that never was before, that listens to the robin listening for the worm, the cedar coral of the morning doves, that takes the path laid down by the slug beneath the strawberry leaves, a quivering track like mercury over the dewfall grass, this is the day the washing hangs so full of light and snowy folds it makes one rippling garment, a robe tried on by the breeze. This is the way we take ourselves on waking into what we are, the high blue sky without a cloud, whatever it is that calls to us out of our own astonishment. This is the morning. If memory serves me correctly, I think that was ten years ago this summer that I wrote <clears throat> that I wrote that poem. Um, this next poem is a childhood memory, um, and there it, it's essentially a, por a poem about making a moral decision. Uh, the <clears throat> the thing about which the moral decision is made is not very momentous, but uh, if you cast your mind back to childhood, usually the moral decision, uh, the more trivial it was, the more momentous it seemed. And um, <clears throat> what I do in the poem is I fish, an, I fish a spawning bed out of season in Minnesota, and, um, and I get what I deserve. There's, a, there's a, a reference here to my being made to take a nap. This uh, poem is uh, set in, in terms of time in the summer of 1952, and um, that was the, the big year of the polio scare. And um, I took over a paper out that summer from a neighbor kid, and uh, because he was ill, it turned out he had polio. Uh, about three weeks later, I began to exhibit symptoms and uh, <clears throat> was taken to the hospital for a spinal tap and so on, and I, I was lucky I didn't have it. But uh, that's, there are a lot of sort of unspoken references here that, that have a lot of weight behind them for me. This poem is called The Catch, Battle Lake, Minnesota, 1952. Below our cabin, a sandy road that led to the general store, the boat dock and the other cabins of the small tree-set resort dipped down into a hollow where it crossed ten yards from shore, a creek whose clear, sweet water spilled into the lake. It was here the day we arrived that I knelt and dipped my hand and felt the pull of the water's glide and, rising, saw in a pool where the creek swung round a drifting school of bluegills, impossibly large and fat ones the size of a grown man's hand. Though a white wooden sign forbade it, spawning beds, no fishing, May through June, I hurried up to the cabin, fishing my rod from the pile of things that I'd helped to carry in from the car for mother to sort out and stow away later that afternoon, and ran back down to the bridge, secreting the pole and open face reel beneath it, and on down the road, through spurting sand to the store, where I bought a carton of mealworms and walked back winded with them to my catch, my furtive purpose. I was ten years old. I knew the difference between right and wrong, knew from the sign that this was wrong, yet felt a tug like the currents undeniably strong, and knew, had known from the beginning, I would bait up the wriggling hook and let the light, shot-weighted line drift in among them. It was pure Eden, that hour of fishing. At the end of it, my rope stringer sagged with fish. I tied it to a plank end on the bridge, drawing it through the loop at the other end so that it made a kind of wreath of fins and tails and gills that swayed like coral, and I went up to lunch. 
Afterwards, I helped with the dishes, and then my plans gone glimmering, was made to take a nap in the cool back bedroom, the light off the lake trembling on the ceiling, translating the slap of water in the reeds outside. When I awoke, it was nearly five. I ran to the bridge. The stringer was taut, and looking down through the water, I saw a turtle chewing the tail off one of the bluegills. I hauled at the line, feeling it suddenly give way, and up through the sun-drenched water, I drew my string of fish, half of them only half there. Ribbons of flesh and torn pink guts come drifting up with them, caught up like banners in the current. And on the bridge, I took them off one by one, heads and whole fish, and dropped them into the water. <clears throat> it's another memory of childhood. Um, the summer I was four, I had virus pneumonia. I was very ill. And um, I mean, I don't remember this, but my mother tells me that for about a year and a half afterward, about the only thing I would eat was peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. And uh, this is a memory of my uh, grandma and grandpa Shields farm in Arkansas, and of her making me um, the grape jelly that she heard the story that I craved. I say at the end of the poem, she somehow knew I craved. I don't think I've ever divulged that actually I know how she knew that I craved the jelly. <laughs> Makes a little better story. The farm in Arkansas. The pump on its concrete slab with its arm of flashing water, so cold it burned clear through me. The grape arbor on the south. In the fenced-in lot by the barn where Josie the mule held out knee-deep in the dust-choked weeds, a harrow left standing so long its teeth were sunk deep in rust, and the barn dark chinked with light, the dropping spattered floor, hay sifting its way down through the loft with the twitter of swallow and sparrow, and the leather smell of the harness a whiff of dry sweat and urine. Walking Grandpa back from his chores and milling around outside, grasshoppers crackling and whirring in the tall grass back of the house, watching a butterfly, all white, shoulder the sun on its wings and stagger away in flight. Then in through the screen porch door, the slapping back of the spring, the radio on inside, and there at the sink stood Grandma up to her wrists in grapes picked while my back was turned, rinsing them off at the tap, the fruit heavy and jouncing on the bubble juggling stems, the big blue speckled pot set on the front of the stove, ready to make the jelly she somehow knew I craved. <clears throat> I don't know why I divulged that, to the audience, <clears throat> I guess that's the right of the person writing the poem to, to, to fiddle the truth a little bit. <clears throat> I didn't really want to get into that because I, the, the poem isn't about my having had virus pneumonia when I was four. This is a little elegy called Uncle Lou. <clears throat> I remember he kept, when I was young, a little flock of pigeons in the shed. I would hear them chortling behind the door as he fumbled with the latch. We'd enter a dimness full of the richest smells, mash and droppings, feathers and sidling dust, the doorway lying tipped across the floor in a light in which we stood exalted. Once he caught one and, while cupping its wings in his hands, let it peck at the corn and millet that I held out to it. And that was like him, to make you a part of things. Today the flat of my outstretched empty hand tingled when I heard that he was gone. 
I, I think writing does a lot for a person. Um, it also exacts a lot. It, it um, you know, it, it takes a pretty high price in terms of, of time and so forth. Um, you have to develop a, at least a second skin to deal with uh, rejection and being ignored, especially early in your career and so forth. Um, by definition, a writer is somebody with a very healthy ego, and it's very difficult to deal with the fact that nobody knows who you are or cares uh, when, you're, when you're a young writer, generally. I was influenced, I think, by uh, the fact that I could read some poems in Greek. And uh, the economy of the Greek lyric, the four, five, six, eight line lyric, is something that really impressed me. And it's been kind of a model for me to write that kind of poem. And I have uh, written a number of shorter poems. That's been one of the criticisms that's been leveled against me, <laughs> in a way, by some critics that, you know, get away from that s short poem. And I can, I, I can understand that criticism. I, um, my shortest poem is, is a one-line poem. I wrote several of those, and my longest one is nine pages long. So I, I think that uh, I would like to do more long poems. But. The next, I guess, maybe it's six poems that I'm going to read are from a, a chapbook called The Voice We Call Human. I think I will read these without uh, interspersing any anecdotal or background material and just read them more or less in sequence, although they don't all come next to each other in the chapbook. In orange and yellow. The first good rain in months and the lilies across the alley by the neighbor's fence lean slowly over as the drops condense and trickle down their throats, their colors never before or after so intense, adding a flush like love or violence against the slats of shining cedar. Hoarfrost. The windows on the side door of the garage are frosted over. And when I open it, a few loosened flakes drift down in sunlight inside the doorway, glinting as they fall. Is it their swivel that reminds me somehow of chimes, a still winter music struck off one brimming crystal at a time? The glass does not reflect their loss at all. Inside it, as on beds of stone, the light picks out the fossil hairs on fronds of fern, so cold to touch, they make my fingers burn. <clears throat> uh, I'm a frustrated painter, and a lot of my, not a lot, but a number of poems <clears throat> are either about paintings or have titles that would suggest that if that were I able to paint, it would be a painting. But since I don't, it's not, and it's a poem. And this next <clears throat> is, is a poem like that. It's called Still Life. Five or six apples in a cut glass bowl, spelling out welcome on the kitchen table. A gesture tempered by the paring knife, sharp edge out, facing the door. The blade on its side on the half of an apple that someone's left the seeds in still dark orbit inside the core. Welcome, stranger, to this light, the wholeness offered like a cup of water from a brimming well, the flecks like the rough wood of a bucket swung over the snow's new fallen white, the crunch of footsteps in every bite. Antique Wren House. Light as air, the bones that entered here, the quick feathered motions, flicker of wing and tail, bearing a twig or wisp of grass or needle of pine turned rusty to weave into a nest. And that light air, 
the song they ran through here, bubble of pure quicksilver, piercing the listener's ear, is bedded down in silence, reverberant and clear. Heron feeding in rain. Working the shallows of the farm pond, he wades through algae like a jade-edged mirror. The light rain preens on the surface. The heron turns to stone. He waits for the coil of minnows to come, wreathing its way through the water. The sullen flash as they turn and fade like a breath passing into the glass. He will shatter his own reflection, picking one out as they pass. Another thing that I like very much about writing is that it does allow you to, how shall I say, to overcome your personality. T.S. Eliot speaks about this. Um, you can escape yourself. You can become a character in a narrative poem. Uh, you can get some characters going in a situation going in which <clears throat> you really don't obtain at all. Uh, you're not part of the equation. And increasingly, that's something that, um, that I appreciate. Um, I think starting in the oh, late 70s, I started writing some poems about my childhood. That's been good for me. It's been good for me to recover um, that part of my existence. I think probably the, the, the voice that I write with is, is pretty much me, but I think it's parts of myself that are very often hidden, very often submerged, that don't get play otherwise. Um, as a writer over the years, I think I've developed, uh, I've let my sense of humor come into the writing more, um, which I've always had. Um, <clears throat> it, it, it allows, I think writing allows you to, to sort of dredge up or bring up parts of yourself that you might not otherwise do. And as a teenager, I was very introspective and, and I wouldn't say shy, but withdrawn. And uh, I grew up as a lonely child and so forth. I wasn't an only child, but there were six years between my brother and myself and I was the oldest. So for a long time, I was either on my own or I, I, I preferred my own company. <laughs> And I've always been kind of a loner. I suppose looking back over my childhood, I, one could predict that I might have become a writer because I think one thing that produces a writer is um, a sense of vulnerability, a sense of loneliness, a sense of being cast on your own resources, using your imagination. The square fold is, is about my uh, paper out days. And um, this is something that I notice that the, the paper carriers no longer use is the square fold. And so it's a poem describing what you did and then describing how it could be thrown and the uh, different effects that you could uh, get with the square fold. Of course, this depended on, on the weight of the paper. Uh, we never square folded Wednesdays. Now, you could, but if you hit the front door with it, that was it. You know, I mean, you hit a glass door, <laughs> you know, you were going to be paying for it. It may be an instance of childhood to write, uh, excuse me, an instance of nostalgia to write about your childhood. Um, it may be, I'm not sure. I, I see it as a very legitimate subject. Um, <clears throat> and I, I firmly believe that a poet should write about any subject which engages him or her. Um, but I'm not really sure exactly how this one came about, except um, in one of those kinds of flashes that comes to you out of nowhere and there's no reason for it. And suddenly I found myself remembering the good old days when <clears throat> paper boys and, well, there were some paper girls, but not that many at that time, uh, would do a square fold. Uh, <clears throat> if you were a cool paper boy, you square folded your papers. And, um, and so this is really about how you did that. and. Uh, plays around a little bit with the various ways of releasing and curving it around obstacles and so on. Um, the square fold. With the first fold, <clears throat> you'd make a long rectangle, headlines facing in. 
and that you'd fold in thirds, then tuck neat as a pin the right end into the left. Though hardly origami, it was fun and something of an art to craft for its short run out of the news of the day a paper glider you could sail and curve around a column or let fly if you had the nerve in a long looping line at the top of which it loomed a bird reflected in the door glass then suddenly blurred fell stricken to the porch floor and if you were any good you did this on your bike with a showman's flair calling to witness your neighbor customers watch this one how its wide float will bring it drifting in and this how it shears when i zing it at the end how this one's back curve lands it smack dab on the doormat one of my earliest passions this daily format four to five of folding then packing the bags on the handlebars and off on my schwinn like floating beside the cars on busy south street small beside the news i carry polio korea bikini atoll in my portfolio sometimes people um ask, and I think it's a good question, but I'm not sure <clears throat> that I know the answer to it, will ask, why did you write that poem? And I, I think most of the time I'm not able to, to answer that question. Sometimes there's an occasion for a poem for me, that is to say, um, <clears throat> an elegy is occasioned by a death, of course, and sometimes there is an occasion, or sometimes I have seen something, but, but some poems seem to just kind of float in from somewhere, and I'm not sure where they come from or whether I should write them. Um, <clears throat> I kind of let those questions, I leave, leave those questions up to the reader for the most part. I just, if they come, I'm happy to, to accept them. Uh, another memory of childhood, although this is, uh, I, I'm older in this poem, <clears throat> has to do with my one and only experience of hunting. Um, uh, the catch, of course, was about fishing, and this is about hunting, although it's I'm not actually hunting here. I go with my father, and he's not actually hunting either. Uh, and this is an example of bad hunting. This is an example of the kind of crazy hunting that, uh, that sometimes goes on, although it's not as bad as, as some of the stuff that you read about. I read in the paper the other day somebody with a high-powered rifle had uh, killed a bald eagle somewhere in Nebraska. I can't believe that kind of thing. Um, anyway, <clears throat> my father was an attorney at the time of this poem, and he had some business in Tecumseh one Saturday morning, and uh, we drove down there, and then when he was finished, uh, we went hunting. He'd arranged with the other attorney to, to go hunting. Well, the other attorney wasn't a hunter either, so um, <clears throat> maybe this poem is, is about getting out and pursuing avidly what you have no idea uh, that what you're doing with or about. Um, on reflection, that seems a very strange sentence. <clears throat> anyway, this is called The Squirrel. I woke to my father saying my name in the darkness of my room that morning, and in the dark I dressed. It was the day he had promised me our trip together. Some business at a distant county seat, a man he had to see, and then by prearrangement, a bit of squirrel hunting. I had never been, and something about the long, blued barrel of his new 410, its soft glint like the pelt of an animal, had fascinated me the night before as I watched him clean it. I carried it to the car now and laid it in the trunk, treating it as though I understood the death that was its purpose and our aim, and closed the trunk lid on it, out of sight as good as out of mind, the snick of air pressed out beneath the closing of its lair, dismissing it like leaving it behind. 
A few hours later, I glimpse the courthouse dome above the almost leafless treetops. I listened as my father and the man whose office we were in began to talk, my eyes roving back and forth between the man's desk with its green glass shaded lamp and the books that rose in tears behind him. Then they both signed a paper and shook hands and the man smiled at me and said, let's go. How many gravel, tire-tracked country roads we drove down late that morning as the man showed us the countryside, I couldn't say. But suddenly, as we were heading back to town, up on its haunches on a fence post, the slide of the braking car spinning us in the gravel toward the ditch, there it was, watching with widened eyes the moment widen as the man jumped out and made for the trunk slipping and almost falling on the gravel on the roads hard under surface, regaining his balance with one hand on the fender, judicing as he tried the wrong key in the trunk lock, then in one motion had it somehow open and his shotgun out, a blur of metal, the squirrel having leaped down from the post and lit out in the meantime for an oak maybe a hundred yards across the field. The wind up now, the light a nimbus round anything that moved, and the man bracing his shot on the abandoned post left it yards and yards behind the squirrel, kicking a drift of chaff up with the dirt along a row of stubble, leaning the gun against the fence post now and stooping through the gap of strands he made there in the wire, his eyes wild as he motioned us to follow and set off at a run across the field stopping once to get another shot off. Myself, the contortionist now in the wire, the barbs setting my back to tingling with imagined lacerations, now holding the strands for my father like some outlandish bow, its pull at last too much for me, letting one tooth of wire graze his jacket. Both of us pelting now across the field, stumbling along between the furrows, legs heavy, aching, lungs heaving for air, the squirrel treed, the man awaiting us, nervously circling on the fallen leaves, and as we came up and stood there panting, he fired point blank, the squirrel scrabbling a little further out onto its limb, the shell ejected from the broken barrel, lying facing me bright on the leaves, the click of the closing, and then another shot gone home, flesh softened with a small, damp sound. And I could see the heaving, bloodied side as the squirrel tried to crawl a little further back in the turning leaves. And then the third and final shot. Next time, we'll use a rifle, the man said, with the squirrel by the tail. He wouldn't hear of our not taking it. Back in town, we stopped off at a bar. My father for the beer he said he needed, I for the apprentice's orange knee-high. We sat beneath a mounted leaping bass hung on a plaque against a wall in one dark corner. A very different sort of trophy, it seemed to me, from the tattered paint rag of a carcass lying in the trunk. I thought of how my father had started for his gun there in the trunk before we crossed the field, but left it thinking, I guess, there wasn't time. Or maybe a premonition of the kill, the sheer unsport of it, decided him. I sat there fingering the one spent shell I'd pocketed because I coveted its coin-bright casing, listening to the wind cornered in the doorway on its rounds, the only one with anything to say. <clears throat> I don't know, we never talked about that, my father and I. Um, <clears throat> and again, there's probably a story behind that. I'm not absolutely certain as to why he suddenly got a 410 shotgun. Uh, <clears throat> but. Um, there was a feeling of embarrassment. Maybe it's like uh, Sandberg says in his poem about the hangman's family. He ta Sandberg says that around the dinner table there are some subjects they, s they keep clear of. 
Nobody asks him, how is it at work today, Dad? Uh, <clears throat> but we never talked about that. Uh, we just felt that sort of embarrassment about it. The only other time I hunted, and it wasn't hunting, somebody, when I was a kid, somebody was always handing me an, uh, a BB gun or something and daring me to do something. <clears throat> and a neighbor kid handed me his new Daisy air rifle and said, I'll bet you can't hit that turtle dove, which was about 25 feet above my head on a wire. And I shot once into its feathers, and the, uh, the shot just seemed to be engulfed by the feathers. And then I shot again, and I hit it right on the side of the head on the temple, I guess. And, and it plummeted down and died. And I just felt, uh, I don't know, I just, it wasn't something that was for me. I don't, I'm not inveighing against hunting. I'm just saying it was, it, I, I just knew then it wasn't something for me. But I think hunter, hunters and fishermen have this in common. Um, and many uh, sportsmen, outdoorsmen, of course, are both. But I, I think they have this in common, that the real thing or that they go out for more than anything else is the uh, getting out of the city and getting out into the countryside. This next poem is another elegy. It's called Effects. Lifting the lid of the rosewood box that had no lock, but its own snug fit. A little rush of air came up with it. I peered at my father's things. Two polished rocks the size of bird's eggs, black speckled with white, nestled by a pair of onyx cufflinks monogrammed in gold. In the soft chinks of a chain lay twists and coils of light dangling from a tie clasp and the luster from a long, curved, pearl-handled pocket knife, itself tight-lipped as he had been in life, shone like the brink of tears. From death's muster such objects are exempt, free of all but the long parting duty of recall. Relic. What is this the jawbone of? At a guess, I'd say a mouse, the left mandible. Finding it by the house in loose dirt beneath a yew bush, hardly recognizable, I brought it in and rinsed it at the kitchen sink. The water's rush parted around it as by a keel, then, then tapped it dry on a tea towel. It had come mostly clean and it was beautiful, the long white curve of it tapering off in the still keen incisor, the molars at the back giving it all the look of a gondola pitching slightly on a dusky canal's black water. Here on my palm it weighs next to nothing. Riding so lightly it seems impossible it could carry such calm this tiniest of barges, long ago set out on the waters of death, sands mourners and dirges. Uh, just too many influences, really, I think. I, I could, as I said earlier, I think you're really influenced in one way or another by almost everything you read. Um, <clears throat> In recent years, I don't read nearly as much poetry as I used to. I read um, a lot of prose. I don't have that much time to read. I'm, I'm terribly busy. Um, I, I'm, I'm, when I am reading poetry, I'm tending to go back and reread the old stuff that I've read before. Um, lo lots of good poets in Nebraska. I'd hate to get started on that. I'd, I'd leave somebody out. Um, but I'm good friends with several of them. And, correspond with a number of them. So, uh, I will say that uh, Dana Joya, a critic and poet who lives back east, remarked in 1988 that Nebraska undoubtedly has more good poets per capita than any state in the country. And I think uh, <clears throat> that this is, this is not something that I'm saying. This is something that uh, comes from outside the region as a kind of validation of the energy and creativity that's here. This next poem 
that I'm going to read probably requires more explanation than I can give it. If you don't know the painting, uh, this I, I don't know whether the poem will have any interest for you or not. But the title of the poem is Grant Wood's Stone City, which is a, po uh, a painting that I sort of stumbled onto about uh, five, six years ago. And then I started reading, well, I, I had seen reproductions of American Gothic, of course, and, and Daughters of Revolution and, and a few other paintings. I started reading up on Grant Wood shortly after, after that. And in one of the books that I came across, I realized that Stone City was a real place in Iowa. And um, when our younger son began attending Beloit College in Wisconsin, our, uh, I figured out a route that would take us, looked on the map and figured out a route that would take us through Stone City. Um, I was absolutely stunned because Stone City, first of all, is not a city, it's a village. And secondly, it is almost unchanged from the painting, although Grant Wood did take a lot of things out and take some liberties with uh, contour and, and so on. Uh, I'm intrigued by, by him as a painter in his best work, and some of his work I don't care for very much, but I would say his top eight or ten paintings are, are really first rate, and I think he really probably doesn't get the credit he deserves. Grant Wood's Stone City. Here in the valley, where the painting concentrates on the bridges' girdered sides above the gliding chalk blue water of the river, the single pier, a single heavy slab, casting on the surface a light reflection, its inverted misty top like the edge of a cloud, which if it glides, it glides in place on the moving water. The hard-edged light, a halo round that mild May afternoon, held still in the perspective for almost 60 years now. Seedling corn plants stitching the loam of the foreground like yarn on a comforter. The neat white farmhouse and all its red outbuildings gathered in below. And over shoulder there, the mostly shadowed face of the limestone quarry, though the shadow deeper now, riper, the long fissures like the ridging veins of a fallen leaf. I stand in autumn light, gazing down on leaf gold flowing water, on stones the color of silted leaf mold on the bottom, seeing how much the painter simplified the bridge from its three present piers, how he in fact left out 25 yards downstream, three now abandoned piers where the train ran its loads of quarry stone across, yet left the water tank on thick cross-timbered stilts, a trestle of shadows long gone now at their foot, the light blindingly white on the inn beyond them, there where the road bears north, meanders round a curve, dips in behind a barn and clump of trees, and climbs by pasture and wooded slope to the horizon, the eye invited in, then out by road and river, to what the paint holds here, Miss Nomer's eulogy, the dreamed of city that never came to be. That's <clears throat> Miss Nomer, one word, M-I-S-N-O-M-E-R, not Miss, M-I-S-S, -S, capital N. In this one. You might have wondered who Miss Nomer was. <clears throat> um, I think Stone City embodies really the the fate of so many frontier um, <clears throat> towns and villages, most of which are gone now. Stone City is, uh, is amazing in that it's still around. But uh, the big dreams, uh, you know, the ideal location and having the quarry there and having agricultural land to the south and having lots of woods to the north, and you can hear, you can still hear that kind of talk in retrospect about what the advantages were. Um, but it's, it's very interesting. 
Uh, this poem is, is forthcoming in Swanee Review, uh, along with Effects and Relic. Uh, it should be out any time now. I'm going to close with uh, three new poems. Um, <clears throat> I'm always of two minds as to whether to read new work. Um, I know Greg Kuzma likes to read new poems at a, at a reading, and sometimes I do and sometimes I don't, but he has more courage than I do, <laughs> I think, in that regard. Um, but I will. I, I will anyway. These are, these are short poems, and the first one is called The Door. And um, again, I think probably this poem is triggered by a painting or a series of paintings. When uh, this fall, taking our son up to Beloit, we stopped in the uh, Cedar Rapids Art Museum and I saw the Marvin Cohn paintings of, of uh, doors. Uh, again, he, Marvin Cohn, had a good sense of humor. If you see it, it's obviously the same upstairs area. And these are upstairs doors leading to attics, but there, sometimes there are three or four doors as though they were all leading to, to separate attics. And if you look in these pictures, there's a picture of Grandpa on the wall. But in the various pictures, the picture of Grandpa is moving around to different places on the wall, and Grandpa's expression is changing in the various pictures. So I, I appreciated that a lot. But uh, I think having seen these paintings and just thinking about them a little bit, not intending to write a poem, and then um, hearing, as we hear in our house about on the order of two or three times a week, footsteps upstairs late at night. It sounds very much as though somebody's up there. Uh, <clears throat> so I think those two things kind of came together in this poem, and I, it's too new for me really to know much about it. I'll read it anyway. <clears throat> the Door. She was afraid at night of the closed door upstairs, Silly, really, she told herself. Who or what could be there? Still, there were the times she'd heard someone or something clearly. Not just the settling of the house, and always at night. And once she dreamed of her hand on the cold porcelain knob, how it turned and the door creaked open, and the attic stairs rose in darkness, and a chill ran down her back as something stirred in the black. Or someone. Was it her husband, dead all these years, gone before her as he'd always wanted to come back to tell her something? Featureless, indistinct, something more sensed than glimpsed in the darkness a tightness at her chest, and then she'd wakened. Perhaps she would never know. But always aware of the door, she lay awake at night, her hand caressing the hollow on her husband's side of the bed, listening for those footsteps, feeling the knob's bright chill, until there came to take her far in the early hours asleep like that of the dead. <clears throat> well, I teach at, uh, at Doan College, and recently we, uh, we have something called the Cobb Lecture Series. And recently we, we had uh, this year's um, lecture, and the, our, our guest speaker was Miroslav Halab, who's a poet and scientist from Czechoslovakia, internationally known figure. Um, <clears throat> and I was, was, uh, had my class joined with some other classes listening to him one day, and he told, told an incredible story. I found it terribly moving. He told it in response to a, a question that, that a student had asked. And, and Halab tends to sort of be oblique and sort of drift away from the question and maybe talk for five minutes and everybody in the room is convinced that he's forgotten about the question and then he'll come back to it. And this was that sort of thing. Um, and this is one of the ways he came back to it. He told a story about his mother in her 80s. She had been a professor of languages and decided to, to learn Spanish, to teach herself Spanish. So she got herself... Um, Spanish book and would sit down in the chair by the fire after uh, dinner 
and she would uh, do her Spanish, and <clears throat> she had some trouble seeing at this time, and it was a real labor for her to do it, but it was a discipline that she was insisting on. And <clears throat> she's, she would have her pencil, and she would underline certain verbs or certain endings and so on and so forth. And he said every night uh, she would fall asleep over her study. And as this would happen, the, uh, the pencil would make a little sort of a squiggle-like drawing. And he said uh, she did that for years. I mean, one didn't get a sense of exactly how many years or exactly what the time frame was here. But it was sort of like a fairy tale. The, the time frame didn't really make any difference. The, the story was just spellbinding. And uh, after she died, he came into possession of this uh, Spanish book. And she had gotten to page 26. And all 26 of those pages contained these little squiggle drawings. I found it a very, very moving story. And he went on to tell the student that he had tried to write some poems on it and was fairly certain that he wasn't going to, or at least if, if it was going to happen, the poem was going to have to come and get him. I, I guess what I'm doing is, really, the reason I'm writing this, I think, I haven't shown it to Holub. I think the reason I'm writing it is to say to him, whether or not he ever sees it, go write that poem. Go write that poem about your mother. Anyway, it's called Primer from Miroslav Holub. The lashes fall first over the straining eyes. The lashes behind which she stands as though looking out through a waterfall at the Spanish words. Her primer of trabajar, of emplumado, the film of sleep fallen over the mind, and the pencil with which she's underlined and annotated staggers and gyrates like a slowing top, producing in squiggles a child sketch grazing the page as she drops off. Night after night, year after year, this woman well on in her 80s keeps reading and falling asleep on the page, lashes and pencil in headlong collusion, reaching page 26 when she dies. How does the poet recover this woman, his aged mother, Recapture the nod and the falling off, head pitched forward over the pencil, over her chest, the book's white hands reaching up for her face. How can he come to such sheer disclosure? Let us in on all that he feels. It is all or nothing. There is no turning back or aside from the poem once undertaken. For when he looks back now, She's locked in the years, summed in the salt that moves only in tears. <clears throat> I don't know whether I'll show him that one. I have to. I, uh, I interviewed him, and I, I'm going to tr transcribe the interview and send it to him. And maybe I'll just send that and just tell him that's what happened. He's a real nice guy. I think he'd be, he would take that okay. And he's so energetic, I can't believe it. I mean, if I had stayed with him over those two days, he would have run me into the ground several times over. And he's, he's an amazing man. <clears throat> I have one more poem here. It's the newest poem I've written, and it's called Form. A glass of water on the table, filled with light from a nearby window. And though you did not see the light poured evenly and from all sides, until it fit the glass's contours and the water's slightest fluctuations, you see the shape the three maintain, and on the table, at the glass's foot, the light's pale, slightly trembling shadow, its low reflection like a little moon or a coin of energy plunked down beyond it. And now your thirst divines this water, this glass and light, and delves the world. This much 
no more just now will do. Um, my feeling on form, I think, is that it is not the thing contained nor the container, but the process of containment. And, and, and I think that's really what this poem is about. I think, in a way, this poem helped me to, to get that idea a little bit more clear in my mind. I want to keep hold of this poem if for no other reason than <clears throat> it makes an excellent way to end a reading. This much, no more just now, will do. Thank you. <laughs>